Brought to you by Squarespace. Ten years before the Airbus A380 took to the skies, Lockheed Martin had an idea for a colossal, huge, double-decker super transport plane. An insane aircraft designed in 1996 that was bigger than a 747 and carried more passengers than an A380 and would have dominated the skies. And it was so big that they would need help from both Airbus and Boeing to build it. Let's explore this never built aircraft in Found and Explains 400,000 subscriber extravaganza. It's the 1990s and airports have a big problem. They are full. Going every place in the world, all attempting to get there the fastest way and the safest way. That's what aviation is. Air travel has become so popular thanks to large aircraft like the Boeing 747 and economy class tickets that runway slots were filling up. Airports that had previously given away landing and takeoff pairs to airlines were now selling them at a premium, with some popular airports like Heathrow and JFK selling them for millions. Airlines could no longer grow because there was only so many hours in the day to land at these locations. Thus the solution was bigger planes. The jumbos are coming. Boeing had started the trend with the 747 and Airbus was following with the A340 series and there were rumours that they were both working on something even bigger. Hint, hint, A380. Lockheed Martin, who had left the commercial aviation division after its L-1011 trijet design, wanted a piece of the pie and decided to think of the next logical step in aircraft design. This led to the creation of a program called the Large Subsonic Transport, a series of designs of an aircraft that would be the natural evolution of the Boeing 747. This aircraft would solve the problem of limited airport capacity, fill rising demand in places like China, and be the next military aircraft for the US Air Force, who had fleets of transport aircraft approaching retirement age. Working with NASA, they came up with a report that would fulfill all of these requirements. This is what it was. As I'll mention in a moment, Lockheed would need all the support they could get for this project, even recruiting both Airbus and Boeing to build it. But as you can imagine when they called them up, Boeing and Airbus would have simply been confused. After all, they had never heard of this project because Lockheed didn't have a website. Something that they could have avoided with today's sponsor. Squarespace. That's right, if you're launching a new airframe or just need a new website, then Squarespace is the best website builder. And now I'm going to tell you why. They have plenty of great templates, or you can have a go building your own design with their powerful code free builder. They have built in e commerce tech right into the platform to add products and start selling right away, and inbuilt email campaign marketing tools that are easy to use. And also, their sites are already optimized for mobile phones. Plus, when you click that link, you're actually supporting the channel by helping fund the animations and videos that you love so much. So really, it's win-win. To get it, simply go to www.squarespace.com found and get 10% off your first site and domain. So don't be a Lockheed, be a supporter of the channel instead and click that link when you need a website. Back to the show. The report had a great title, The Future of Very Large Subsonic Transports, and the aircraft designs inside were even better. The team outlined several different concepts that would be the then future of air travel, such as a giant span loader or partnering up with Dorna for a gigantic seaplane as well as two simple designs with low wings, with two built-in tail engines, and a blended wing body. But it's the final design that was the most fleshed out. It had the catchy name of the Lockheed Very Large Subsonic Aeroplane, and this thing 
was huge. It had a takeoff weight of 1.4 million pounds with four powerful engines. And it also had a wingspan of 282 feet with folding wingtips, much like today's Boeing 777X, which brought it down to 211 feet, which was the same as the Boeing 747. Its length was also huge as well, coming in at a staggering 262 feet long, making it one of the longest planes around today. Needless to say, this aircraft would have dominated the airports around the world and required extensive modifications to the runways and gates, much like the A380 would 10 years later. But I'll get to that point in a minute. Let's talk about what it would have been like to fly on board. This gigantic aircraft would have had a capacity to carry around 900 passengers on board, with them split 450 on each level in a three-class cabin configuration. This aircraft was impressively wide as well, so passengers might have found themselves in a cabin 17 seats across, or 3-4-3-4-3 with four aisles. In comparison, today the maximum that aircrafts go across is 10 seats, so it's a wide boy for sure. There are also studies into modular passenger sections that could be swapped out between flights and inclusions on board such as a spa, restaurants or maybe even a casino for when it flew over international waters. Lockheed Martin also planned for a cargo version of this aircraft with intermodal containers. Yes, the same containers that are used on trains, boats and trucks loaded onto a subsonic aircraft. The plane would have been able to hold 16 of these containers on the lower deck and still carry 450 passengers on the upper deck, making it perfect for island destinations such as the Caribbean. Now, if this all sounds very heavy, then you might be onto something. In fact, it's the first of many flaws. In the design document, the plane only had a range of 3,200 nautical miles or around 5,900 kilometers. This is shockingly small compared to the Boeing 747, which had a 7,700 nautical mile range or the Airbus A380, which today can fly 8,000 nautical miles. The most popular destination route at the time was between London and New York, which had a distance of 3,008 nautical miles. So it would have been possible for this jet, but any routes over the Pacific would have had to land in either Alaska or Hawaii. And this would have made it unpopular for Asian airlines or those in the Middle East as it couldn't fly far enough. And believe me, they needed every airline on board that they could get especially when you look at their projected sales numbers. You see, Lockheed Martin was optimistic and believed that they would have a market for around 280 to 370 aircraft. For comparison, the Airbus A380 only sold 242 units, 38 less than the minimum number predicted for the Lockheed Martin very large aeroplane. But this was the early 90s, full of montages and peewee hockey teams winning the Olympics. So of course, they had hope. They planned an optimistic price of these aircraft around 200 to 300 million US dollars, which is about half a billion US dollars today. It's even more optimistic when you realize that airlines at the time made less in profit per year, and Lockheed was planning to sell them multiple of these aircraft. With a market in sight and a solid concept under their arm, the team went forward with the study. So why was it never built? Fascinatingly, for once, an aerospace firm showed hubris, and at the end of the study, Lockheed Martin admitted that it had neither the resources nor the know-how to build this plane. They suggested that they would have to partner with Boeing and Airbus simultaneously to bring this aircraft to the market with a total development cost of 18 billion US dollars. And this isn't very far-fetched because as you know in my Airbus Evolution video that I did, I mentioned how Airbus and Boeing were originally working together on the A380 before Airbus went solo. But this wasn't the only flaw with the Super Lockheed Plane program. 
there were also several other disadvantages to the design. The first would be the incredibly noisy takeoff and landing. Even with modern engines, the sheer size of the plane with its four engines would be like a rocket taking off, and you know this thing would guzzle fuel, making it incredibly expensive to run. The aircraft would also require all new gates to be built and new service vehicles to perform turnaround tasks. It would take a long time to board and even longer to unload all those modular containers. It was so heavy that it would crush most runways when it landed, and if it landed in the sea during an emergency, it would sink almost immediately. Speaking of emergencies, it was apparent that passengers would have a difficult time evacuating. If you're located in one of the middle seats, you're pretty damn far from the nearest exit, and it would very likely not meet FAA evacuation guidelines. And another thing, how high up would the slides need to be to get out? It would rival those at a water park. And believe me, I'm not done with emergencies. The study also need to examine the what if scenario if two of these planes hit each other on the runway with over 2000 passengers combined. What a mess. Lastly, its size would also create a considerable air vortex that would delay planes landing or taking off behind it, reducing the number of airport slots and completely negate its original purpose for busy airports. So what was even the point in building it? As the design was so different from a standard aircraft, Lockheed Martin was not entirely sure how it would fly in the sky or how it would handle normal aircraft's day-to-day -day flight operations, requiring a ton more study, research, and wind tunnel tests. Alas, this proved all to be too much for the company that had only recently moved out of commercial aviation, and the project was shelved, noting at the end of the report that someone would make this aircraft one day. And in retrospect, Lockheed Martin might have been right to bail on this one. Airbus would go ahead to build the A380, and it would never really be that successful beyond initial orders. And when it was cancelled, the world of super large aircraft would come to a close. Today, point-to-point -point travel with ultra-efficient aircraft are all the range, and the Lockheed Martin dream has become a vision of a forgotten future. In my personal retrospective opinion, it seems for Lockheed that they were looking in the completely wrong direction, and they should have spent some time building very small, fuel-efficient aircraft like the Airbus A220. But that's just my personal opinion. This video is a remake of my original video that I made two and a half years ago, and I never dreamed my channel would get this big. I want to thank you, yes you, the person listening right now. And this is actually me being genuine, I'm no longer reading the script that I prepared for this video because I want to say, uh, somehow looking through the screen at your eyes, thank you very much for watching and helping me follow my dreams of making a YouTube channel about planes and other crazy machines. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.